how are you today? We pray that you've had a magnificent day today. We pray that you are doing well in the Lord. And we pray that you are excited for the word of God that will come forth and strengthen you. The word of God says in Proverbs 4 that it gives strength to us, even in our bones and even in our flesh. So we want you to be prepared to receive a blessing tonight in the name of Jesus. And we do. We, we're going to be selfish tonight. It's for you tonight. Hallelujah. It's for you tonight. In the name of Jesus, you can call somebody, text somebody, and bring somebody into the room with you. But tonight, that word is for you. And the Lord is going to bless you tonight because he knows the sacrifice that you make on this Wednesday. And we're going to talk about the importance of being a student of God's word. How many know tonight that being a student of anything takes time? Amen. It takes time. If you got to be a student in school, what does it take? It takes time it, in spite of them not being in the schoolhouse. Parents and teachers, and they're still spending time preparing lessons. Children are in their rooms or wherever they are, and they're taking time to study their lessons. So they are students. Can I ask you a question tonight? Are you a student of the word? <laughs> Are you a student of the word? Now, that don't mean that you catch us on, on, on Sunday and you get your word fixed. And, and even if you're here on Wednesday uh, getting it, but are you a student of the word? Are you even studying the word? even throughout the week, in spite of Sunday school, Wednesday night in church. And I mean to say that is that, are you just, now look, listen to what I'm saying. Are you spending time with Jesus? Because Jesus is the word. Are you opening the word? It doesn't mean you have to be at a desk and you're writing all of these notes and things like that, like, you know, I do, but that's a call on my life. Uh, so that I can prepare and teach the word to you guys. But are you spending some quality time in the word of God? And many of us would say, oh, pastor, I don't really have time. And, you know, uh, that's a lot of excuses for a lot of people, except those that are on the line right now. You know, we know that you guys are faithful. But even our family and our friends that say they're Christians but how deep are they in the word of God? And you know what's going to happen with that? The Lord is sharing right now is that we're going to have to be the ones to promote that learning and those that are not learning. And we're going to have to start establishing some small groups. And we know that that's the vision of our church, especially now in this season of pandemic, that we know that we have to come together as a group of believers even in small groups, whether it be text groups, and share the word of God. So you may want to even start doing that. And you have a discipleship partner. Remember, administrator assigned us all discipleship, discipleship partners. How many have kept up with their discipleship partner? <laughs> I did. I text mine this week, but I hadn't been consistent with it. But why don't you text your discipleship partner? If you don't remember who it is, text administrator. Somebody will let you know who it is. But the Lord wants us to come together and share the word of God. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. Amen. Praise the Lord. So let's get right into the word today. Let's have a word of prayer. We're so grateful for your tuning in with us today. Lord, we bless you today. Hallelujah, Lord. We are already filled in the name of Jesus. And we're walking in the baptism of the Holy Ghost right now. So you're going to send that, that spirit of edification even now into our mouths. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So we bless those online today. And Lord, we know that it oftentimes takes a remnant. We know that we may not have everybody in the church involved, but Lord, we're going to have to be the ones that reach out to others that are not as consistent. So we pray even now the spirit of boldness, the spirit of attraction, hallelujah, Lord, to others, a spirit of compassion to those around us that are not in the word and not receiving the blessings of God because they don't know the word of God, hallelujah. 
So open our hearts and our minds tonight to receive the word, not only to keep it, but to share it, to go out to the hedges and the hills and shout out the word of God, especially to our friends and our family in the name of Jesus, whether that be by action or whether that be by word. So we thank you and we love you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, we pray, thank God, amen and amen. We're going to get right on the lesson tonight because it is magnificent. So we are now on our third lesson, being a student of God. So what have we done thus far? First, we talked about three keys to a happy life, right? And that lesson was about what? Can you remember what that lesson was about? It talked about being prayerful being pure, and having praise in our heart. That leads to a happy life, a blessed life. And in the Old Testament, that word blessed usually meant happy. But it's some, a couple of instances where it meant a lot deeper, but we won't go into that right now. So that is keys of a happy life. If you're prayerful, if you praise, we just read Proverbs 17, 22 says that a merry heart is like medicine. Hallelujah. And a, dry, and, and a down, distraught, and depressed spirit, it dries the bones. I was talking to somebody today, and we were talking about our health and how we're going to try to do better health-wise. And, 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 you know, but the Word of God says that the medicine of God is to have a joyful spirit, a merry heart. So you can walk all you want, run all you want, eat all the right foods. And if you are stressed out, your health will deteriorate. Hallelujah. Even scientists say the eating good and, and even the exercising is only 40% of really the goodness of your health. The rest is mental. It's spiritual. It's emotional. Hallelujah. And let me tell you, the word of God, hallelujah, it brings a peace to you, ladies and gentlemen. Hallelujah. I'd like to go into that, but you know me, I'll be staying on that a little bit too long. So what was the next lesson we went through? The next lesson was how to live a pure life is when you feel overwhelmed. Know how to live a pure life. And so we talked about two weeks ago how to live a pure life. And what was that about? It was talking about memorizing God's word, verbalizing God's word, and making God's word personal. You have memorized a verse in the last week or two, trying to keep that word fresh. How many of you have verbalized a word in your, in your life, something that you're going through, and putting your name on it? I tell you the best uh, one for many of us that are beginning is Psalms 23. You just got to personalize that and say, Lord, you said that you're my shepherd and I don't have to want. You said that you make me to lie down in green pastures and you bring him back accountable to his word. Hallelujah. The word of God says he cannot deny himself. What does that mean? That he cannot deny his word and you bring that word before him. That's why it's so important oftentimes to memorize scripture. So why? You can pray the scripture. Well, I told you we're going to be studying about apostolic prayers. We might touch on one tonight. Those prayers are awesome. Paul praying, you know, and sharing so many things in Ephesians and Philippians. And so we're talking about that. So we talked about what? When have you felt overwhelmed? And that was last week's lesson. And we know that in this day and time that we are, it, it's a time of Overwhelmment, if that's even a word. <laughs> Hallelujah. But with things taking place the way they are, it's easy to become overwhelmed. Whether it be spiritually, emotionally, financially in the name of Jesus, whether it be in the sense of your marriage, your children, uh, and, and mothers and fathers now are overwhelmed with the children in the house and having to help them with work and things like that. But the Lord of Lords, the God of God said, he who keeps his mind stayed on me. He'll keep them in perfect peace. Why? If you trust him and that will keep you from being overwhelmed. It talked about God provides for what he requires. And then it talks about, watch this, it talks about the Bible is the storehouse of his provisions. So we need the Bible 
as a student of the word of God to receive the provisions of God. Amen. Hallelujah. When it comes to the deeper things, the provisions for you spiritually, I know some of you got good jobs, good retirement, and, and you're being provided for by the government, but the deeper things, your provision of health, how about that? You can't buy health. <laughs> you can't buy peace. But the word of God can provide that for you. Amen. I'm saying amen to that on my own. So now we're in lesson four. This is an exciting lesson. And we know that we've been going through uh, the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, Psalms 119 is broken up into 22 different areas where uh, David is going through the Hebrew alphabet and all of the chapters that are in that part of it is representation of that. And we're now, they're saying, on the fifth letter. Now, I, I kind of like Hebrew and Greek, you know, especially since I've become uh, a pastor. I've really been doing a lot of studying in Greek and Hebrew, uh, a lot of word study, because when you uh, start uh, learning the word and you, you want to get deeper in the word and you need to know some of the Greek orientations of words and the Hebrew. So I kind of like studying those things even before I was pastoring. I really like that. And we're now in the alphabet and we're on the fifth letter. And how many know what the number five stands for? The symbolism of number five is what? grace. Amen. And the letter that they're talking about now is hey. It's H-E, but oftentimes you see it as H-E-I. And if anybody knows anything about Hebrew, the Hebrew alphabets are really pictograms. They're pictures. You know, the, the, the first letter is what? Aleph, right? Aleph stands for ox. The second letter is Beth. Beth means what? House, right? Bethlehem means what? House of bread. Amen? Amen. And then you have C is Gamil. And Gamil stands for what? If you look in at your Greek, it stands for a camel. And then you have Delai. I think it is called, the, the D is Delai. And it means door. So now we're at He. He is the fifth alphabet. And the pictogram for hat is a window, which means it's something to look forward to. The fifth time David is mentioned in the Bible, the word says that David had favor on him. What's favor? Grace. The fifth time Ruth's name is mentioned in the Bible, it talks about Ruth, what? Having a sense of grace. Everything in the Bible is so precise. When you begin to look at the lettering, you begin to look at the numbers and the symbolism of it, that God had a perfect plan for his word. And when you start looking at the types and the symbols and things like that, we understand that God had a meaning in that. Abraham, before he was Abraham, he was what? Abram. But when God gave him a new name, guess what he put? Ha, huh. Abraham. Ham, that was the grace of God. Before Sarah became Sarah, she was Sarai. What did he do? He moved that and he put ha, Sarah, and grace. And what does that mean? It means Abraham and Sarah began to what? Multiply. When you have the grace of God, you began to multiply. Even in Yahweh, in the Jewish language, they don't put uh, a vows. And in the Hebrew, Yahweh is yah ta va He hey is in there twice. Grace twice. It's va ha ve ha And so it is mentioned twice, the grace of God. So God is really intentional about lettering, about numbers. He put a lot of effort and thought into this word of God. So when we read it, as a student of God, when you start seeing numbers, like the number 40, like the number 120, all of those numbers have great significance. So when you begin to study the word, scripture begins to come alive. And many of us say we love Jesus, and we do, but we don't love the word. You know, that's somewhat of a major problem. If you love Jesus and don't love the word, because he had to tell me that. He said, Mikey, I know you love Jesus, 
But you know, you ain't in love with my word. You know, you're in love with my word somewhat if you got to teach, preach. But now the Lord is causing me to read just to read. And I started doing that before I was a pastor. So don't think, oh, yeah, well, you were a pastor. No, sir. I started doing that when I was working at East High, working at the University of Alaska Anchorage. And the Lord just started putting it in my heart to love the word more. Amen. So let's get into this lesson tonight. Psalms 119 is an acrostic poem using the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 stanzas with eight verses each. This lesson will examine the fifth stanza, which is headed by the fifth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, which is He. This session rhythmically reminds us of the importance of being good students of God's word. We will see at least three things to do as we study our Bibles. First thing is what we do is pray for illumination. So let's read uh, Psalms 119. 33 through 40. Let's get the verses out before I keep going and miss that because, you know, I do get a little excited. So we're going to go through verses 33 all the way to 40. If you got your Bibles looking on the screen, read them with me. Speak these words out of your mouth. One, two, three, go. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my what? My whole heart. Hallelujah. Make me walk. Now watch this. It don't ask God to do it. It says, make me. God is so awesome. It says, make me walk in the path of your commandments. For I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and remind, revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. Do you know how many times David said, make me? <laughs> He's like not asking. You know, sometimes, just like Psalms 23, it says, make me to lie down in green pastures. Because oftentimes we, we too silly to lay down. And that just means rest. We oftentimes too silly to rest. We just got to move, move, move. And the Lord is, and David is saying, Lord, make me to lie down in green pastures. That represents a sense of resting. So he says, pray for my illumination. So it talks about illumination is the process of shining light to make something visible or understandable. Watch this. God wants all people to hear and understand his word. This is why Christians start schools everywhere. They take the gospel. This is also why missionaries give their lives to translate the Bible into other languages. Christians realize basic education is fundamental for people to understand the Bible. In fact, the first universities in the United States were established to educate Christian ministers. Amen. That is so very important. Now listen to what I'm about to say. If we as a church and as Christians would really do as disciples and teachers and preachers and evangelists and prophets, and if the body of Christ would be obedient to the word of God saying, study to show thyself approved unto God, rightly dividing it, a workman that needed not be ashamed. If we would do that, do you know we wouldn't really need seminaries? If we adhere to the word of God, and if we, y'all sit down back there. If we adhere to the word of God, and if we were obedient to God in regards to listening and studying the word of God, you know, we would, lead, we would need a lot less paying money for things even now. But we have had so many distractions in our life. Yes, it, and the devil has made it that way, that we need to work 10 jobs to make ends meet. And then uh, we got 150 
channels on our TV, and, and we're trying to do this, that, and the other. So he has distracted us from the Word of God, you know, when really, in all reality, we should be pouring into the Word of God. Do you know that in the, in the Jewish tradition, that by five years old, the youth had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. And some Jewish traditions say that at three years of age, they had to memorize five to seven books of the Bible because you know what? They were inundated with the word of God. There was no TVs, no cell phones, no iPads. So what the family did and what we have failed to do, many of us in our lives, especially Baptist folk, as we have, my children and I just talked about it yesterday, we, we, we've fallen away from being consistent Reading the word of God as a family, even as husband and wife, big dent in our, in our house right there. Yes, indeed. I, I will admit to that. And even my daughters will say, yeah, dad, you know, we're really inconsistent about that. So we're really trying to do better. So we do. We understand that. And so we have to understand that we have to be students of the word of God. When applying for admission into a university, you may have to answer this question. Why do you want to attend our university? In verses 33 through 35, the psalmist tells us why he wants admission into God's school. Why does he want to learn God's law according to verse 34? He says he wants understanding. You know, many of us, I know, and listen, one of the things he said at the beginning was, you know, uh, uh, we need to make sure that we have an illumination and an understanding of the word. And you know, it, it would behoove you to pray every time you open the word of God and pray that the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the greatest professor and teacher in the world, to teach you to open up, to illuminate your understanding. Why don't you go to Ephesians 1.18? This is what Paul said when he was talking to the church of Ephesus. He was sharing with them the word of God, and this is an apostolic prayer. In Ephesians 1.18, how Paul is sharing with the church of Ephesus. In verse 18, he says that he wants the word of God, verse 18, in the eyes of your understanding, being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance, and the saints. Leave it there. So what does he say? He wants the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. It means that he that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of the inheritance of the saints. Now let me explain that real quick to you. That's why we need to know the word of God. Many of us want the promises that God has for us but we don't know the promises that we can decree and declare the promises of God. And there are many books. It's a book that I have called The Promises of God. And it talks about promises for health, promises for marriage, promises for peace, promises for finances. And you can get these online. Uh, it, it, you don't even have to pay for most of them. They're already online. All you got to do is put the promises of God. Once you know what the promises are, you can start claiming your promises. They're yours, ladies and gentlemen. Your healing, that's your healing. You got to claim it. Finance, you got to claim it. Yes, it takes some growth. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, we're all going through the same thing. Everybody got something in their lives that they're continuing to pray for. The sermon I'm preaching on Sunday is what are you praying for? And many of us have not seen the manifestation of our prayers come into uh, to fruition. But we just got to keep digging into the word of God, speaking the word of God. Believe in the word of God. Faith cometh by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. Acts 2.42, let's go to that. Acts 2.42 talks about what did they do as a body of believers. They did what? They continued steadfastly in what? The apostles' doctrine. They studied and they fellowshiped. What do you do when you fellowship? You're encouraging one another. In the breaking of bread, they ate together. They had communion together. And guess what they did? They prayed together. 
They prayed together, as we're doing every morning at 7 o'clock. And we just had our team meeting. We're going to keep pushing that prayer until the Lord says otherwise because we know that prayer changes things. We had about 42 to 45 people online this morning. And here's a heads up. You can't get on late else you're going to miss it. Set your clock for 5 to 7. You get on at 702. If we got a quick person, you're going to miss it. Don't want to miss your prayer. That is your bread for the morning, the bread of life. Hallelujah. Almost going into what we're about to talk about. Jesus is the bread of life. The word of God is the bread. The first thing in the morning, what? Not to have to eat a, a Pop-Tart, a toaster strudel, a bowl of cereal, but the bread of life should be our breakfast. That should be the first thing that we eat. Because of our fallen nature, we don't need anyone to teach us how to sin, but we do need the scriptures to teach us how to be righteous. As the Bible teaches in Romans 3 and 10, none is righteous, no, not one. But if we look at 2 Corinthians 5, 21, which is a verse that we are, have stapled our whole entire lives on, is that we're the righteousness of God. In Christ Jesus, it says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Leave that verse up, please, Miss Media team. What, 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 what does that really mean? Jesus, watch this now, because this is going to blow some of y'all's wig back. Jesus became sin without sinning. Correct? He was spotless, blameless, never sinned. So how can we become righteous? We became righteous without doing no righteousness. Oh, that is sweet. I'm going to say that again for myself. Jesus became sin by doing no sin. So we become righteous by doing no righteousness. If you gather that today, man, it will change your prayer life. It will change your prayer life. If you know that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Well, pastor, I don't feel righteous. I don't look righteous. You ain't righteous within yourself, but you're righteous because of Jesus. Jesus is standing before the throne and God sees Jesus in you. Hallelujah. I'm going to get going and keep going to the other end. Okay, let's see. This doesn't mean that there are no decent people in the world. It does mean we all tend to sin because we are selfish at the core. The psalmist understands this and wants God to teach him to be righteous. So he asked God to illuminate his mind so he can clearly see God's statutes and laws. It says, list four ways scripture prophets us according to 2 Timothy 3.16. How uh, did you list that? 2 Timothy 3.16. What does it say? We need to be, the word get, it brings a sense of profitability, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Uh, media, why don't you put that up in the message Bible? 2 Timothy 3.16. Let's see what it says in layman's terms. It says, every part of scripture is God breathed and used one way or another, showing us truth exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, and training us to live God's way. How sweet is that? The word of God, basis of construction before leaving earth. So it says, one of Satan's power, powerful lies is God's way is not fun. The evil one wants to convince us God's commands lead to a dull, boring life. However, the Bible is the source of deepest delight. Let, let, let's just pause here. So many of us, you know, at times, you, you know, even go, going to church and, you know, our church, we, we do as, as a church, we have to work on that. But you know what? It's, it's really personal. We can blame the church and we can blame the pastor, the Sunday school teachers. We can blame the music in regards to church. But it really comes down, you know what it comes down to? One word, love. How much do you love Jesus? How much do you love him? You know, so people that say, oh, Christianity is boring. You, you really just haven't fell, fallen in love with Jesus. And, and I know, as especially youth and even our adults, 
you know, we were online, our staff was having our staff, our uh, executive meeting today, and we were sharing that, you know, it's a lot of members still that are not online. And, 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 and so that means that they really wasn't in love with, with the word of God anyway. So it wasn't no big surprise that they don't make the effort. And that means people that are not working. And, but, but it's people that are not online. And we know that they know we online. Because I was like, well, maybe everybody don't know we're online. And our, and our staff, you know, our chairman and our vice and, 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 uh, and our administrator, they was like, oh, Pastor, they know. They, they just are choosing not to be online. What a terrible indictment on somebody to say they love Jesus. Yes, I'm calling it out. Because you know what? In this day and time, we need as much word and fellowship as we can get. So we can't say that the word is boring. What happens with that is we often become, watch this, ungrateful. You know, I keep saying that. It keeps coming up. Familiarity breeds contempt for those who don't have their whole heart in God's hand. We become familiar. And so church becomes boring. And, but what are we doing to bring excitement? We, are we coming for a show? Or are we coming expecting the word of God to change us? That are we coming into the sanctuary, waking up in the morning saying, Lord, are you going to speak to me? Even if the pastor don't do nothing but read the text, give me the scripture, because that's where the word is going to speak to you. And, 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 but are we doing that? Are we waking up excited saying, man, I know it's going to be a word because I do know pastor know how to read the Bible. So I know he's going to read some verses. <laughs> so I know he's going to get that right. But we've become bored with the word of God. If we even had an opportunity even to love it in the first place, I shouldn't say the opportunity because we have the opportunity, but many of us just don't take the time. And it's just the same thing in our families. Why have marriages become boring? Because we've taken each other for granted. But time, one of us gets sick. I can remember when my wife called me after the earthquake. You know, even we walked out the house today and I said, oh, lowly, I love you walking out. But that time when that earthquake came in and she's done it too, we don't, we, we got to do better. And let me tell you, that time the earthquake came and then we finally got in touch with each other. She said, love you to me in a different way. Why? Because that could have been a threat on my life. We could have lost one another. And we do, Lord, in the name of Jesus, help us now. We take for granted one another. We take for granted Jesus Christ, our Savior. We take for granted the word of God. We take advantage of the church. Many of us, if you ain't missing church, you didn't love it anyway. Now, I do understand that the, the pandemic has caused us to use caution. But if you're not itching to get back into the sanctuary, you need to question yourself. Even though some of us, we know we need to stay clear. Amen. For, for safety precautions, for health reasons. But if you don't have a desire to come back into the church house and to be amongst the saints of God, you need to really pray tonight and ask the Lord to what? Illuminate. His love for you. Oh, yes, this word is heavy tonight. It's such a blessing, though, because it's showing me when I feel like church is born, when I feel like uh, I don't want to come on Sunday morning and, and drag, and it shows that, you know what? You don't love Jesus as much as you say you do. You're, being, you're ungrateful for what God has done for you, Michael, that you feel like you got to drag yourself to church. Don't get up with any energy. And that, that happens to me a lot on Sunday mornings. By the time I get in the sanctuary, now it's even better. Because now I hear the laughter and the, and the encouragement from the people of God. But if you are not missing the church, if you are not in love with the word of God, that means that God has not captured your total heart, ladies and gentlemen. And listen, I am beginning with me. My heart is just beating right now. And if the Lord looked at me the way I looked at him, my heart would stop. <laughs> if he was like, well, I don't feel like blessing Mike today. I'm just going to let him do it on his own. And let me tell you, you drop dead like a bag of a sack of potatoes. 
and the Lord is saying you have to fall in love with the word. We're going to, y'all, hopefully y'all, y'all, y'all studied this lesson because we, we're going to have to blow through this real quick because the Lord just gave us a lot more insight on this. It says, even now, let's read he Hebrews eleven twenty five, uh, describing his choice. And I guess I should read that for you. Hebrews eleven twenty five. It says, there is a temporary pleasure in sin. Otherwise, no one would want to sin. Yet that short-lived fun gives birth to long-term trouble and regret. Moses could have lived a princely life in Egypt, but he didn't. How does Hebrews eleven twenty five describe his choice? It says, he chose a hard life with God's people rather than an opportunistic sort of life, sin with the oppressors. And that's the messenger Bible. But it, it, oftentimes the life that we live as Christians, it is hard. And, and it, it's already a scripture in here in regards to saying that if you live a godly life, you will suffer persecution. I think that's on the next page. But don't be offended when things are not going your way. Don't be offended. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean out into your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So what does it say? It has said that first we need to pray for illumination. And then it says the next thing is avoid temporary preoccupations. So what does it talk about? And we just going to go through this preoccupation with selfish gain. And what does that mean? It means that we are preoccupied with everything but the word of God. And it's saying that we need to not focus so much on all of this temporary stuff. The Bible says that the word of God will stand, the flower faded, the grass faded, but the word of God, it will not fall away. It will not return void. It will stay the word of God has staying power. So it says that we should not be preoccupied with selfish gain. And so it says the truth is everything belongs to God. We are short-term stewards and should invest in resources wisely. Everyone will be judged on their earthly stewardship. Faithful stewardship demonstrates our love for God. Jesus plainly states this reality in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. It says, write the final words of that verse below. You cannot serve God and mammon. That's God and money. So you have to understand, and I was sharing with someone that we were meeting today about tithing. And, and, and sometimes, you know, on giving and being cheerful givers because the money is not ours. And it does, man. It takes work to be able to release. It's easy to give when you got a lot. Now, many people can say that. Well, that ain't even everybody. Some people still don't want to give when they got a lot. I mean, uh, some people so cheap, they squeak when they walk. But some people, uh, uh, are, are, they will give. They'll give. And they'll give even they don't have enough. I was sharing with somebody today that had given. And they didn't have a lot. And I was like, you know, that's why the Lord continues to bless you. And believe me, the Lord is going to continue to bless you more than you can ever imagine. And we pray the prayer of faith over our giving. And, and then we pray the prayer of faith over our receiving. Hallelujah. The Lord wants us to receive as well. And so it talks about that we can't serve God and mammon. You can't be preoccupied with how much is in your retirement fund. And because, you know, and in your stocks and even in the bank account. Because we know that can be wiped out in a heartbeat. Stocks and everything like that with the stock market crashing. And, and, and that could be wiped out. But, but even more, your life could be snuffed out. You know how many people have saved every penny and died before they could spend any of it? I'll remember this story uh, that, that a wise man told me. This guy worked all his life, pinched pennies. And he worked all his life, and he built up all of these resources and monies. Then he retired, and this is supposedly a true story. And he was going to go on vacation, 
one of the first vacations he had been working all of these years and he was going to go on vacation and he had his bags packed and he fell of a heart attack at the door and died before he could spend any of the money that he saved 50, 60, 70 years. Tomorrow is not promised to you. Stop holding on to what God has given you. Not to be foolish now. The Bible talks about giving of your first fruits. And that does, it takes practice, it takes a building of faith. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a witness. That there are times when I see that there's more uh, 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 bills than what's coming in the house and things like that and, and praying through that. But I know that I'm being obedient to the Lord and he's changing things because I'm better than I was last year. Amen. But he's blessing me and he's moving us in that area. Number two says preoccupation with depreciating doodads. What's a doodad? Well, when I was growing up, my mother had, you know, many of us had when, uh, older folk, I'm aging myself now, they had china cabinets. I know the older folk is like, I remember china cabinets. And then you had this little table with all the doodads on it, all of these little glass things or whatever, knickknacks. And we had all of these things. And some of these doodads could be expensive and you didn't really leave them out. But it was just, it was expensive to you. <laughs> and if you were to sell it to somebody else, it wouldn't have no value to them. And so we cannot begin to buy things that depreciate, depreciate and doodads, as they call it. It says King Solomon wrote an entire research paper on the acquisition of these vain things. We know that his writing in the book of Ecclesiastes, after getting all the gear, browsing all the books, marrying all the maidens, constructing all the castles, and experiencing all the excesses, the wisest person in the world, other than Jesus Christ, comes to the conclusion... What does he decide? According to Ecclesiastes 12, 13 CD, it says that fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. The word of God, ladies and gentlemen. The word of God. So don't be preoccupied. With things that don't matter. The Bible talks about in Corinthians that don't set your eyes on things that are temporal. But things that are eternal. And we know that the eternal things are the things of Jesus Christ. The love of God. The word of God. It says, not only that, but we should have the right aspiration. We should have the right aspiration. So what is aspiration? If I were to ask you, what is your aspiration. Do you have an aspiration? And if you do, what is it in and what is it for? An aspiration is a hope or ambition of achieving something. So what is your ambition? What is your aspiration? And it talks about because of severe opposition from the world, the psalmist prays in verse 38a, confirm to your servant your promise. The word translated your promise is probably best, better translated your word. Because the psalmist is not referring to a particular promise, but to all of God's word. Hallelujah. To all of God's word. God will for confirm all of his promises. And as I shared with you before, it's hard to get a confirmation of something you don't know is yours. Do you know your promises that God has given you? The promise of long life. Hallelujah. It doesn't say the promise of untimely death. Me and the Lord is still, he's still trying, he's sharing with me about untimely deaths. But we don't know what's on the other side. We don't know what caused people to pass away before their, their time. Whether it be babies or whether it be great men of God. As I shared with you before, a great man of God that was in my life. Uh, was an apostle and, and passed away. Uh, he was younger than I was. And I seen the mighty works of God that, that, that was in my family. An immediate essence of him being a blessing in my family. Saw miracles work through him. And so I had to really go before the Lord. 
and ask him why, but I don't know the whole backstory. Amen. That is why God, that is why progress is God's school. Requires us to increase our understanding of God's word. Increase our understanding of God's word. It talks about that in Colossians, I think it's 1 and 10. It talks about increasing in the knowledge of the word of God. Where we can pick and choose. In Matthew 4, it says it's not like a buffet style. In Matthew 4, Jesus overturns Satan's temptations by what? Quoting the eternal truth of God. Satan knows Jesus is hungry and dares him to turn stones into bread. So what does Jesus reply? As he said in Deuteronomy 83, 8 and 3 in Matthew 4, he says, we live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. As we were praying today online, we, our theme was healing. And if you missed it, we pray even for you for your healing right now. But we were decreeing and declaring the word of God over our bodies. Over our spouse's body, our neighbor's body, our son's or our daughter's body. We were decreeing and declaring the word of God that he, he wants us to be healed. That we're healed by his stripes. And we understand that in Jesus' name. That we are healed by the word of God. Uh, and I'm trying to tell you today, speak the word of God into your body. Out loud, look at your knee and say, knee in the name of Jesus, I command you healed. I command you to leave pain. Lay your hands on it. I'm telling you, it works. I woke up the other morning and my hips, man, my, my wheels were squeaking, seemed like. And I said, the devil is a liar. And I spoke, as I've told you many times before, I didn't tell you about my elbow, my knee, my hips, my foot, and man, I start talking to my body. And I tell you, your body has to obey the word of God by faith. Now, your heart got to believe it now. Hallelujah. That goes into the point of how much have you been in the word and are you just saying it today, but do you believe it? How long have you been in that word to speak that word confidently? Hallelujah. So it says, the psalmist states in verse 38b that we will fear God when he confirms his promises. That means reverence. Why is that true? The first chapter of Revelation records the Apostle John's personal encounter with the awesome resurrected King Jesus coming to judge the world. What is John's reaction? John fell at his feet. Now watch this. If you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then you should be absolutely terrified. We're going to go on right down to Hebrews 4.16 because those are online. We know that you have a relationship with him. We know that those that are online, you are the ones that are sold out for the Lord. That's why you got to hang on for your blessing. I'm talking to somebody right now. The Lord sees your sacrifice. So you go boldly before the throne of grace so you can obtain mercy and grace in the time of need. He's going to give you help. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Hallelujah. Last page. Hallelujah. And this is very important. And I think 1 John 5, 14 echoes the same sentiment. When we approach God in the name of Jesus, we can come to the throne of grace with confidence, boldly come before him. And that verse literally means that we can speak freely. And if you look at that in the Greek, it almost means to the point of disrespect that you come so bold, it don't matter how much bad you've done, you come boldly to the throne of grace and you obtain that mercy. That's a, that's a, a military term where you obtain it. It's like you've taken it because why? It's yours. And the Lord loves it when you come boldly to the throne of grace. He cannot stand somebody coming with their tail between their legs, all pitiful. That don't impress God. Matter of fact, that's pride. I'd love to teach on that right now. Many people think pride is having your stomach all put, your chest all puffed up and all of that. But you know what else is pride? Being timid and pious and wimpy. <laughs> that's pride. You know why? Because you're thinking more about yourself and the way others think about you than you are before the Lord. And the Lord already know who you are. The Bible says he didn't give us a spirit of fear or a spirit of timidity. And that word means 
poweredness. He did. He gave you a, a spirit of love and power and a sound mind, which is self-control. God wants you to come boldly to the throne of grace and say, Lord, I received my healing in the name of Jesus. I know for a fact you died for my sins. And I rebuke the devil, the demon, the adversaries that's trying to keep me suppressed in sickness and pain and poverty and debt and bitterness and hatred in the name of Jesus. And we come against that in Jesus' name. I just spoke that into your life tonight. Hallelujah. I'm on fire tonight, man. And I'm trying to share with you the word of God is what's going to deliver you. You got to trust him. You got to stop looking at yourself and what you were or even what you are in yourself and start walking as if you know who you are in Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to go on and read this last, this paragraph, because I'm exhausted. In reality, being friends with Jesus will make us enemies with the world. Jesus promises the world will treat his disciples the way it treated him. And, and that's what I was talking about just earlier, 2 Timothy 3 and 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Don't be surprised. If you're living a godly life, you will have persecution. But let me tell you, God is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Holy Spirit, paraclete, comforter, the one that walks beside is the answer. Through your persecution, he is there for you. The demons and the devils want to do this, that, and the other, and even folk around you. Man, I feel like preaching the sermon that I got on Sunday right now. I'm going to let you wait, though. Be prepared for it because it's going to bless your socks off. In verse 40, the psalmist concludes the stanza with two wonderful lines. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. Wherever you go on this earth, if you listen carefully, you'll be hearing everyone asking the same question. What is wrong with the world? And let me tell you, with this pandemic, people are saying, what are they saying? Man, what is the world coming to? It's coming to an end. That's what it's coming to. But it's no reason for us to fear. And it's no reason for us to pack our bags and get ready because we still got work to do. You still got some cousins, some nieces, some nephews, even some sons and daughters, and some of y'all spouses and friends that need to hear the word of God. And the Lord is saying it's time for you to talk to them because hell is real. And we need to start talking to our friends, even our youth. If you got friends that they are not saved, start talking to them. Stop TikToking. And start to get to click clocking and telling them about Jesus. How about that? Because he is on his way back. Start sharing with them. And there are even some TikToks out there that these kids are talking about the return of Christ. Every TikTok ain't bad, baby. And there's some Christian TikToks. But let me tell you, it's time to start sharing the word of God, youth and young adults. I'm telling you, parents, start letting your children know that they need to start talking to their parents and talking to their friends, siblings about Jesus Christ. I'm almost done. As we walk in his light, we fight the good fight until one day we can pray what is written in Psalms 116 and 8. So write that prayer below. It's for, it says what? For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I don't know. Are you excited as I am about this word of God? I'm telling you, your life is changing tonight. Even we as seasoned Christians, as we call ourselves, ladies and gentlemen, you can teach your old dog new tricks. <laughs> the Lord is teaching us tonight. Those that have been in church that there's something more. Whether you 8 to 80, blind, crippled, or crazy, the Lord still is teaching you more. You have not arrived. You may have left the station, but you've not arrived. You don't know it all. And the Lord is saying he wants to do a new thing in your life. Even though you 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, there's a freshness for you, ladies and gentlemen. He is saying to you right now that he wants to do a new thing. You cannot get bored with Jesus. Wow. If you are bored with Jesus, it's because you are ungrateful of who he really is. 
To be a good student of God's word, what must we do? Pray for illumination, avoid temporary preoccupations, and have the right aspiration. Praise the Lord. Next week, we're going to be talking about growing your relationship with God. Ladies and gentlemen, if you take this seriously, and I'm telling you, I'm speaking from the heart. Many of us, this word was talking about, have backslidden. And it's not you on here on the line. I pray that it's not. But you know even some of our church members. And, and we're, we discussed on our meeting today, those that are not online, we're going to call and ask, why? Do you need an iPad? Do you need GCI connection? Because we want you to receive the word of God. And if you're just not doing it because you don't feel like receiving the word and being a part of the church, I want to pray with you. Because you've lost your zeal for Jesus. If you don't desire to be in the church house, if you don't desire to be online to study the word, Sunday school and Bible class, you've lost your zeal and the devil has a grip on you. Oh, I'm speaking the word of God tonight. So we thank you for being here tonight, and I know you've been encouraged. You should feel like you have been, watching me make up this new word, discipleized. That's buntonology. You have been discipled tonight by this unadulterated word of God. Hallelujah. If you ain't excited, I'm excited for you. Like, they, like the old man would say, if you ain't on fire, your wood is wet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we bless you tonight. We want to remind you that the food pantry is open today at, at a, a Lighthouse up on Government Hill. They'll be open from 815 to 1015, and they will have food for you. We know that many people are going through so many things throughout this pandemic, and it is no surprise that some of us need additional help. So if you need food, you can go up to Lighthouse and be a part of that. We want to also remind you that this coming Saturday... Is our Fairview Elementary School will be there for food distribution. Brother Amari that is in charge, we want you to come out. We have gloves and we have masks and whatever you need to come out and share. But please be at the Fairview Elementary School this Saturday at 1 p.m. Come out and share. Be a blessing to someone. Also, we want to share with you that on Sunday, we're back at it again, 930 Sunday School, powerful word of God talking about honoring parents. I can hardly wait to share. Ladies and gentlemen, get your children in the room for Sunday School nine, at 10 o'clock on this coming, 930, I'm sorry, 930 this Sunday, 930 this Sunday, honoring parents is going to be the lesson. Please have your children online with us. Then you know our worship service will be online at 11 o'clock. And we do have some more seats, I think. Ladies and gentlemen, you do not have to come once a month. You can come every Sunday if there is a spot. Call the front office immediately. You do not have to just come the first Sunday. No, you are open to come every Sunday if there is an opening for you. We do have some slots left for uh, fourth Sunday and a few for third. But if you want to come every Sunday, we're creating a list for every Sunday church members. You can come every Sunday, and I pray that everybody wants to come every Sunday. It's where we used to be. We're going back to coming to church every Sunday, worshiping the Lord in a safe atmosphere with social distancing, hand sanitizers, fans going, worshiping the Lord our God in spirit and in truth, be excited to come into the house of worship where you can get the word of God straight from the preachers or the teacher's mouth. Hallelujah. Uninterrupted and not distracted. Come into the house of the Lord. Call tomorrow. Get your seat. Let us pray. Father God, we bless you today. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your peace and your power. So we pray a blessing over those tonight that are on the line and those in whom we're standing in the gap. And Lord, we pray for a refreshing uh, and anointing for our people, that, Lord, we would be salivating for the word of God. We know, Lord God, the word is what strengthens us. Lord, the word is what protects us. The word is what keeps us. So even now, Lord, the promises of God, we receive every spiritual blessing in heavenly places.
Jesus. We receive tonight. Bless those who are sick, afflicted, less fortunate than ourselves. Those who have discouraged, Lord God. Those who are depressed. We rebuke those spirits of condemnation and guilt. And we command the fruit of the Spirit to rise up on them. Even now, we spiritually lay hands on the sick, Lord God, whether it be physical, emotional, mental, marital, financial. And we command the prosperity of Jesus Christ over their life. Even now, we love you, we thank you, and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen and amen. Have a blessed week. We love you. We love you. We love you.